<laughs> so, and many of you wonder what, how in the world, as a mechanical engineer, I know half of the stuff that I just told you. Um, it's because I have read the Horowitz, the Art of Electronics book. This book is profoundly good. Um, this single textbook has been useful to me while all of my school textbooks have not. So if you, if, you, if you want to own one textbook that's actually useful electrical engineering, it's this one. All right? Now, at this point, having finished giving you a cursory introduction to the concept of a diode and a transistor and how a diode and a transistor work, we're now going to move profoundly into the realm of entirely useless knowledge. <laughs> Anything that I say from now on is going to be profoundly useless to you. Because now we're going to start talking about vacuum tubes, right? These went out of style in surprisingly late, um, because actually several countries still have factories that make vacuum tubes. Um, but all of this information instead came out of the uh, electronic and radio engineering book by Terman. So if, some, if your professor ever mentions the Terman book, you've now actually seen it. Um, this, the Terman book, is the Horowitz book from before when semiconductors existed. So that's where this is all coming from. So let's talk about the vacuum tube. Um, before the discovery of semiconductors and semiconduction and this P and N doping thing and why the heck rocks lit up when you pass current through them, which is actually how LEDs work, um, they instead used vacuum tubes. Uh, originally called the Audion and originally invented in 1905, yada, yada, yada. Um, the vacuum tube is literally a glass envelope that is under vacuum that has wires sticking out of the bottom of it up to whatever is inside of the vacuum tube. Um, seeing as how it is entirely feasible that the vast majority of you have never actually seen a vacuum tube, I have for your convenience brought vacuum tubes. This first one I'm passing around is technically called a vacuum diode. <laughs> Just as you have diodes in semiconductors, you have diodes in vacuum tubes. So let's talk about the topology of a vacuum diode. So inside of this glass, oh, I want to draw it here. So here's our glass envelope. Here is some number of wires down here. And these would plug into a very standard socket, just as uh, semiconductors do. A little silver spot here. And then you have through the middle a heater. Cathode. And then a plate. So these are all concentric. And so when you look at this vacuum tube, you're only seeing the exterior plate, and then you can see a little bit of the cathode and the heater in between it, which is the white part. Okay. So how do vacuum tubes operate? Vacuum tubes operate on literally firing electrons off into a vacuum and having them travel through this space from, as it travels from the cathode to the plate. Right? Let's see. Uh, I didn't bring the wire. Um, from these pieces of wire right here, I'm, we are about to observe electrons are being ejected. Whoa, nice. Doesn't actually happen at room temperature. Um, this is why vacuum tubes needed heaters. Is it is very analogous to evaporative heat, it evapor like a, 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 like we evaporative cooling. Cooling. Yes. Right. Um, the heater is needed because to get a metal to eject electrons, it needs to be hot. We're talking really hot. Um, so here we have Kelvin um, on the order of about 2,500 Kelvin um, is the approximate effective temperature for emissions of electrons per tungsten, right? Which is um, makes sense because you know light bulbs, right? So literally. This is a light bulb that, instead of being designed to give light, instead is designed to eject electrons. Um, and this is why all of the old books about vacuum tubes always talk about the glow of a vacuum tube, because they literally were glowing, because they had light on it in them. Problem is 2500 degrees Kelvin is really hot. The difference between Kelvin and Celsius is marginal, 
And so this is a really freaking hot um, filament, right? Um, but conveniently, different metals and different alloys will tend to emit electrons at different temperatures, right? And so if this is the surface of the metal, and you have little electrons hanging out in here, and you heat it up, and one of the electrons says, I'm free, and jumps off. <laughs> um, depending on what this material is, the tendency to do that is different, right? So tungsten is about the only attractive elemental metal because it is one of the few metals that can actually tolerate getting that hot. Um, but if we can instead take tungsten and put something else on here, even just the very top layer of it, that's all we need to cover to eject the electrons out of space. And that's um, one of the most popular coatings you would put on tungsten would be uh, thorium. So you would have thorinated tungsten. That gets us down about another um, thousand degrees. So now we're down to 1500 Kelvin. And that is for thorinated tungsten. The third coating that was useful is um, a ceramic oxide coating um, that is conductive but has a very strong tendency to emit electrons. And that's down at about 1250, right? So I mean, the main thing here is that you heat up the filament and it then starts to eject electrons. Um, the diode is a fairly simple case of this because you have the cathode and the plate um, so this is the heater. This is the interior cylinder. It gets hot and it ejects electrons, which then get captured on the larger plate. And they then strike the larger plate and then move on with it. If you apply voltage in the other direction, all the electrons come up to this plate, but this plate isn't hot. This is the other plate. It's unheated, and so the electrons don't jump back in the other direction. And so that's how you get rectification. Um, this gap here, instead of it being about 0.7 volts with a silicon diode, is on the order of 15 to hundreds of volts. So this is why vacuum tubes went on style. Ironically, they're not going back in style because hipsters. <laughs> um, so if you looked at that vacuum diode, um, it, you could see the yeah. So you could. Uh, see, yeah, so the, the shiny metal bar in the middle is the cathode, and then just the two little metal tubes in the middle are the plate, and then all of these fins on it that make it look like a little spaceship are actually for radiant cooling, right? Because you have all of these electrons flying across this gap and striking this plate. Um, this plate gets hot. The problem is it's in a vacuum, and so you can't depend on your standard cool air circulation to cool it. And so that's why you have all of these big flappy fins to just sit there and be surface area to cool it. Yes? So if it does get too hot, can you run voltage in the other direction or current in the other direction? Um, it would have to be excessively hot because the plate isn't surface treated. And so it's not going to tend to emit any reasonable temperature, but very high temperature. Um, also, it's not made out of tungsten, and so the plate will melt before it will get anywhere near its emission temperature. Uh, it's a very uh, standard failure condition for a vacuum tube is that when you overload it, you will melt the plate, and then you know, your vacuum tube will be gone. Right? Just as we have demonstrated that you can modulate the current traveling through a diode, you can also modulate the current traveling through free space. Which brings us to the vacuum triode. Oh, um, and one more thing. Let's talk about why this is important that this be a vacuum. Electron gets ejected here, it rolls along and it strikes the plate. As Eli realized, this plate isn't surface treated. Conversely, if we had a gas in here, like oxygen, so we have one oxygen atom in there, um, 
because of the fact that we have all these electrons flying around and we have this strong electromotive force, this oxygen atom is going to become ionized, become a oxygen ion, and then fly towards the plate and strike it. Right? Because electrons go to the positive and positive ions go to the negative side. Problem is when it flies towards it and strikes this cathode, which has been very carefully surface treated with an oxide or, or a thorium, um, it'll chip off a piece of oxide or thorium. And so as this oxygen ion flies through and hits it, it'll destroy the uh, cathode in a matter of seconds, um, which is why the vacuum is important because we can't depend. Um, I, electrons have very small amounts of energy. Ions do a tremendous amount of damage to the cathode. So that's why if you develop a leak in a vacuum tube, it stops working very quickly. Um, it is also why the vacuum tube has that silvery spot on top of it. it is this silvery spot on top of it is actually a bearing, um, or what's called a getter. Um, getters would be typically, usually barium, but you um, also see magnesium, but pretty much just any very reactive metal. Concept being that any oxygen that has soaked into any of these parts before we pulled the vacuum on it, we can pull a really good vacuum and seal the glass in the envelope to the point where, you know, four decades later, this is still a vacuum in here. But any oxygen that's soaked into the material can then soak out again, right? Just as you can dissolve carbon dioxide and water for your sodas, you can dissolve gases and solids, which then under a vacuum will dissolve out again. By putting this spot of barium or magnesium in there, any gas that does happen to dissolve back out, then just reacts with barium and is gone. So, fun fact, easy way to tell if the vacuum tube is bad, that barium spot turns white. All right, so let's talk about the triad. Because so, we have the cathode, which is heated. We have the plate over here. Um, and we have electrons flying from one side to the other, and we want some way of modulating it with a small signal. Um, we do this with what's called a grid, which is literally just a screen of wire, um, which modulates it. Yes, Eli? What is our definition for a small signal for a vacuum tube? The same definition is from a transistor. Okay. Something come out of a microphone, something come out of an antenna. Okay. Um, I mean, vacuum tubes, from a performing standpoint, are very close to uh, non-exotic semiconductors, right? Obviously, at some point, semiconductors became profoundly cheaper than vacuum tubes, um, but it was for a very long time after semiconductors existed that the actual trade-offs between the two of them fell in, some, in Silicon's favor. Which is why some, uh, vacuum tubes hung around for several decades after semiconductors were discovered and still exist today. Um, because um, uh, in high power applications, particularly vacuum tubes, are advantageous because a really, really big plate of metal is easier to cool than a tiny little piece of semiconductor. Right? So we now have a grid between the cathode and the plate. As an electron is flying through the air towards the plate, which is at a positive voltage, it's going to have to pass through this grid. Let's see if I can find for you. Yeah. Can try this. All right. Yeah. This is a vacuum tube. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. Let's call it a vacuum triad. Um, so the things to note is in the very center is kind of a wafer shaped part that is the cathode. Then you'll see just a spiral of wire going around it. And then on the very outside will be two plates connected together by a bar. That's the plate. So if we apply a voltage to this grid, it will repel the electrons or attract the electrons. If we apply a negative voltage to the grid versus the cathode, so battery, 
we apply a negative voltage to the grid, this will cause regions of lower voltage than the cathode. Any ejected electron will say, whoa, what the heck is this? I don't want to go there. And just fall back into the cathode. Awesome, right? So by applying more negative voltage on the grid, we can stop this flow of electrons through vacuum. If we instead raise this voltage, these negative regions go away, and electrons very happily fly through the air and smash into the other side. Does that make sense? Jeff? Oh, that was just oh, OK. So Jeff, it makes sense to Jeff. Right. So we were talking, here's the modulation, then the out output is this current. So again, we're talking about a transconductive device. So this is almost perfectly analogous to the JFET. Is the JFET the JFET? You modulated the voltage on the gate, and that affected the current from the source to the drain, or the drain to the source, I guess. Um, exact same thing happens here. You modulate the grid. The current from the cathode to the plate is modulated. It also suffers from the same problem that if you apply a positive voltage to the gate, it'll turn into a diode. And so while diode, uh, vacuum diodes are now profoundly expensive, you can get on the second-hand market a vacuum triode and just wire these two together. And hey, you've got a vacuum diode. Sweet. Um, but the vacuum triode has some limitations. First of all, we're talking about fairly large features here, right? I mean, like this is something that we can physically hold in our hand. This thing's like an inch tall, right? These semiconductors are profoundly microscopic. If you remember from your first physics course when they talked about the capacitor, the capacitor is defined as two plates of metal separated by some space. That a vacuum tube is a lot of plates of metal separated by space. And so while the, the inter just erase it. Um, so on your transistor, um, you're going to have capacitances between these junctions just by the fact that it physically is, an, is a you know, physical thing. Um, on a transistor, these are like four picofarads. On a vacuum tube, the inter-terminal uh, capacitances are more on the order of 10 to 100 picofarads, um, which becomes a problem because when you have these capacitances between junctions and you try and deal with higher frequencies, um, it stops working because it all just looks like a wire at high frequencies, which is weird, um, but true. Which then was a problem because uh, radio people realized that there was actually usable frequencies above 30 megahertz, um, which is why amateur radio exists, by the way, is because they thought that nothing above about 200 meters would be useful, so they just gave us everything above that. Um, turned out that you know, um, VHF and UHF and microwave frequencies are actually useful, um, and so they kind of backpedal on that later. But there was still this capacitance issue. So how the heck do you deal with the fact that you have these enormous capacitances between all these different connections and all these wires down here and stuff? You get rid of the wires. So literally what a UHF or microwave tube is, is each one of these different layers is a feed line, like a coax feed line or hard line feed line technically. It's a feed line that comes up to the top of the package and is terminated, right? Um, one of the most common versions of this is called a lighthouse vacuum tube. So what this has is the cathode, grid, and plate has three concentric metal rings that would then have feed lines coming into them from the top. So that is exactly the same as your standard vacuum tube, except that it is, instead of being rated to 10 or 50 megahertz, um, that one is rated to 500 megacycles or megahertz um, and six watts. So that's a profoundly powerful vacuum tube right there. 
So this capacitance is an issue, right? We also have a bunch of other issues. We're going to clean this up. Because um, we're limited in how much power a triode can handle. We have to get the cathode profoundly hot to pass a large amount of current through it. Because as electrons are ejected, they're going to bunch up here, and they're going to slow down electrons behind them. Right? Just as when you're trying to go through a BART terminal or security at the airport, a whole bunch of people are pushing into a limited amount of space, and it slows down everyone behind them. Once you go through the control grid, on the other hand, this part, it would be ideal if we could speed up these electrons. Right? Because once we get through this control section here with the grid, we don't care what the electrons do as long as they eventually get over to the other side. And so we use what's called a screen, which is a second control grid, to speed up the electrons once they pass through this modulation. Does that make sense? Yes? All right. This is called a tetrode. Instead of being a triode, it is a tetrode. So we have grid as our modulated frequency. So schematically, the, the diode, the vacuum tube looks like this. So here's our cathode. Here is our grid. So this would be our input signal. Then we would have the screen. And then we would have the plate. So the plate be connected to about 300 volts for your typical receiving vacuum tube. Your screen would be attached to about half of your plate voltage, so that's about 150 volts. And then your grid would be modulated and be at a negative a few volts, and then your cathode would be your reference. Right? By putting this at about half of the plate voltage, once the electron gets past the control grid, it's attracted to this grid, this screen. The screen, on the other hand, is very, very small compared to the control grid. And at this point, the electron's already moving at a couple dozen volts. Right? Once it has been ejected and is moving and it has accelerated across this space, by the time it reaches the screen, it's moving at 20, 30 volts. When I say volts, in that the electron accelerates as it falls in potential. Right? It physics. So, at this point, it's moving so fast that almost no electrons fall onto this screen, but all go to the plate. Um, to show you an example of a tetrode, I couldn't find any nice transparent ones, but instead managed to quite recently get my hands on a power tetrode. So this has the two screens in it, but in addition to uh, in addition to just the fact that it is a tetrode, it has profoundly better cooling than a glass envelope, because a glass envelope is very thermally insulative, where this is not. So while that vacuum tube is rated for six, your standard glass envelope is rated for about one. This is rated for 150 watts. So in your final power section of your transmitter or receiver or audio hi-fi section, while you would not be able to get away with using a glass one, you would use either a metal or ceramic vacuum tube like this. Um, these powered vacuum tubes would get onto the scale of ridiculousness where you would have individual vacuum tubes about the size of a five gallon bucket. And when you go to Bill Bailey's house, they've got some about that size. Awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, you're gonna love your so <laughs> that's gonna be awesome. So we have this grid here, and we have the screen here. But that's not it, right? So we've now modulated the signal, and we have now accelerated the electrons so that they are no longer limiting our upper limit on power, right? So in a triode, you would have some upper limit on power. You add a screen, you can double, you can, you know, in improve that power anywhere from an octave to a decade more, right? Problem is we have now so effectively accelerated these electrons that they're going to strike the plate with such force 150 volts of un, un, just un, of unforgiving force that from here will actually eject secondary electrons. 
right? Just as when you shoot, when you, just when you do a break in the pool and you shoot the cue ball into the rest of the cluster of pool balls, when you strike a piece, any piece of metal with an electron, it will shoot off other electrons. Hopefully, because of uh, the positive voltage on it, these electrons are attracted back towards the plate, right? But by all of these um, ejections happening, we're slowing stuff down, and that sucks. That's why we want the screen here to be at a relatively higher voltage than the grid, right? Because this is at like negative two volts, this is at 150 volts, and so we help suppress this readmission. To improve that, we also add another grid, <laughs> yeah, right, um, which is called the suppressor grid. See, suppressing the secondary emissions, uh, right? Yeah. So here is a suppressor grid, and weirdly enough, this is almost always attached back to the original cathode, zero volts. So we have zero volts right here. 300 volts, we eject the electron. Zero volts here. Zero volts here is not going to encourage electrons to fall back into the plate, which is the ideal situation, but will instead very strongly draw electrons towards it. Electrons will then get drawn towards the suppressor grid and go to ground, and they're not gone. Right? So the suppressor grid is kind of like an overflow valve preventing these electrons from getting back into the business of the real sensitive parts in the middle that we were really concerned about. So modulation happens on the grid. The screen then gets any modulated electrons out of the way. And the suppressor screen then protects all the previous screens from this final messy impact that happens at the end. Yes. Um, so those are your five um, junctions of the batching tube. In specific applications, this secondary ejection can actually be useful in uh, such things as multiplier tubes, because you would have a long string of plates like this, and then by shooting an electron here, you can shoot a couple electrons here, which then shoot more electrons there, more electrons there, um, and you get amplification via a totally bizarre and weird concept. But So none of this stuff is necessarily bad, but um, in this case, it's not preferable. There was one thing on my checklist. Um, right. Uh, so this isolates these electrons from the plate back into the prior part. It's also useful from a capacitance point of view because the capacitance of problem in your amplifier is between the input and the output. This capacitance is what is a problem. This limits the upper frequencies. This limits how much gain you can have. This is the one that's a problem. That, in our case here, that would be the plate, and that would be the grid. In your triode, those two are right next to each other, and so you have fairly large capacitances between them. In your tetrode, you have one set of mesh between them at a moderate voltage, which then means that the tetrode then looks like instead. Um, so here's our screen. One capacitor to the grid. And one capacitor to plate. So we now have two, di two capacitors between the grid and the plate, which we care about. So if each of these capacitors are the same size as our original capacitor, the capacitance here is half, right? Because we've added two capacitors in series, and one over C total equals the sum of uh, each capacitance in grid, right? Have we seen this before? Fine. By adding the suppressor screen and then the suppressor grid and then connecting it to ground, 
if this bit is connected to ground right here, what is the capacitance between here and here? None. We have, by an order of magnitude, profoundly improved this capacitance issue between the terminals. Because by making this a reference for all of our other signals, there is no way to capacitively move signals through the screen or the suppressor. This is what enabled vacuum tubes to go up above 30 to 50 megacycles, megahertz, without having to resort to the profoundly expensive feed line uh, systems such as the lighthouse style vacuum tubes. So while for a triode or pentode, you would need a lighthouse like that, um, you instead can't see it, but can cross handle 500 megahertz. And again, our standard glass envelope. Um, it's not particularly interesting because it has the plate all the way around it. Um, this is a dual triode. So in one glass envelope, which is the expensive part, we have one cathode and then in each opposite direction, a set of grids and a set of plates. All right, so we've covered the vacuum diode, which is based on only the, the fact, that is depends on the fact that only the cathode is hot. The vacuum triode, which depends on the electrostatic force of the grid. The vacuum tetra, which adds this screen to remove the problem of space charge, where electrons in the air keep electrons on the cathode from being ejected. And so the screen is a voltage event horizon, essentially, for electrons moving towards the plate. And then finally, the suppressor grid solves this capacitance issue, which limits our upper frequency, and improves the signal characteristics for secondary emissions back from the plate. Um, I mentioned like the uh, electron multiplier tubes. Uh, CRTs are also another inter interesting vacuum tube in that um, they take a beam of electrons and shoot them at a phosphor. Um, and there's a multitude of different things like that. But I think I've talked to you guys for an hour and a half. Um, and so is there any final questions about the vacuum tube concepts? OK, cool. So that's it. Um, OK, so when I think of blowing gas, it's you blowing a bubble mm -hmm. of gas. How do you think of vacuum tube? Uh, the vacuum tube would be, uh, first, you would take the base of it. Um, so it's just the section with all the pins. And you would, originally by hand, you would take this preformed biscuit with all the wires through it, and you would weld on all of the actual vacuum tube, right? You would then take glass tubing and uh, several large propane uh, torches, and you would take a, just an arbitrary long piece of tube and seal it onto this biscuit, right? So there's actually a glass joint here. Um, glass blowers are profoundly good at making airtight junctions, and so that, that is fine. Um, you then would, in a vacuum oven, so there's an oven that is vacuum, under vacuum, you would then heat up the top section and pinch it off. And so, and at that point, you would, you would do it, I believe, upside down. And as you're pinching it off, you would uh, add in the trace amount of barium, which you would then use to coat the interior there. So very labor intensive, very skilled labor, and that's why vacuum tubes are, were and still are profoundly expensive. Um, power vacuum tubes like that in the 60s and 70s would typically run you $15 in 1970s money. Um, so the fact that uh, JFETs dropped down to less than $10 a piece was very exciting. Um, I can now buy JFETs and bipolar transistors for less than a cent a piece. So that's why vacuum tubes are now entirely irrelevant.
Any other questions? Cool. Hope you enjoyed that. Okay.